I think the first class that I ever attended with Bill Petit, I was just sort of had gone from the University of Florida to, to Duke to, as, a, as a campus chaplain, a Baptist chaplain. And I thought I would wander around and see what could be found, and I stumbled into <laughs> Bill Petit's class. And I think that day he asked, uh, he said he had been left home and he saw his uh, daughter playing with him. What are the rules of this game? Only rule in this game is you can't cheat. <laughs> I came to find out that uh, you probably will be found to be cheating most of the time if you sit with Petit and <laughs> very long, he will, he will discover you're cheating. Um, I chose the topic early and later Petit and the problematic of Christianity, partly uh, as a result of the experience with uh, Jim Nichol of trying to put together all of Petit's essays that had been published. And some people felt, I think, at the beginning that that was useless, that he was through with that stuff and gone to a new world, and uh, that was no longer relevant. Uh, not just from me, but from Bill himself. I found out in the long haul that that's, uh, that was not true, and I thought it was worth perhaps saying why I thought it was not true. So uh, in January of 1988, I received a letter from Bill in which he indicated, and I quote, from Faith and Existence, which, by the way, I think is the first printed article, he published article, yeah, from Faith and Existence to Polanyan Meditations, I am struggling, struggling to found, formulate, and argue my thesis with, within the first person singular. Of course, the whole philosophic tradition militates against this, preferring as it does the third person. Therefore, my efforts, never wittingly made until Polanyan meditations, are compromised over and over again as I try to follow my instincts and stay in the first person at the same time that I try to speak to the tradition. Incarnate is an interesting stage. There at the heart of the argument, I have the courage of my convictions, but then comp uh, capitulate to Immanuel Kant in the first critique that third person singular thinker par excellence, end of quote. It seems to me that in this remark about this article, the uh, incarnation, the incarnate word in the language of culture, uh, that Petit has left a rather bold but largely ignored sign along our pathway to comprehension of his own early self-understanding as it relates to the Christian faith. So I propose here to accept that lead and to undertake a very preliminary foray. I'm sure that by now we're ho hoping for some preliminary stuff. Uh, it's getting late. But... Uh, uh, a preliminary foray into the larger theme of the relation of Petit's thought early and late to Christianity. In the noted article, uh, incarnate refers to the, the article, the incarnate word in the language of culture done in 1954. Petit holds that the symbol Christ is the focus of a memory and an act, eating the body of Christ in which those who participate are themselves. The Christian word has a content for reflection, but like a mirror, it immediately points away from itself as object, as object for reflection, and focuses the related, the reflected, excuse me. Knower and known are correlative as our lover and beloved. Eschatological issues notwithstanding, the word of the traditional letter of 1 John and 1 John 3, 2 is quite to the point. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
the existential self, the self in its highest potenti potentiation before God, is the correlative of the Christ. On this point, as throughout Petit's discussion of this issue, you will note that his affiliation with Kierkegaard is decisively at work both directly and also in this article by way of the poetry of W.H. Auden. He's quoted here in connection with the present context and elsewhere. By the existence of this child, the proper value of all other existences is given. He is in no sense a symbol. For Petit, as for Auden, Christ, the real presence, is the self renewed and renewing the unifier, the bringer of healing, the lover for whom and by whom the fallen world of alienation and meaninglessness belonging to the dichotomies of subject, object, fact, value, means, ends, nature, history, willing, perceiving, have been and are being overcome. The Kierkegaardian touchstone, most prominent here, is the pseudonym Anticlimacus, you remember the eminently Christian psychologist who is the author of Sickness Unto Death and who describes the self as a concrete relation of finitude and freedom relating itself to itself either positively or despairingly negatively. The correlate of the positive relation is simultaneous relation to God. For Petit, the Christ as symbol points us to conditions of reality and self-awareness described by St. Augustine when he says, He is nearer to us than we are to ourselves even when we are far from him. Petit says, the nature of the symbol, the Christ, is such that it brings us to the most concrete reality there is, ourselves in active relation to God. It is Jesus Christ who brings us to ourselves. The concreteness of this reality consists precisely in real presence, being to be contended with, not mere possibility for thought. The self as the correlate of the God relation, the Christ, is inalienable. As Kierkegaard's Anticlimacus says, the self relation is the worm that dieth not. So the claim here is not that those are not selves who are from the standpoint of reflection and personal appropriation outside of Christ. Rather, what is suggested is that the self unreflected in this mirror, which reveals the self in its full potentiation, is, as Anticlimacus would say, in despair. The highest potentiation of the self is to exist before God, who is, Kierkegaard, that all things are possible. <clears throat> it is important to remember these determinants of the category despair here. Then one knows what issue is being raised when the obvious scandal intrudes in the form of some such question as whether Einstein or Wittgenstein or Heidegger or Polanyi were in despair. Petit suggests that the Christ is both a yes and a no to culture. And it is Christ who points the way beyond the perennial affirmation in human culture, excuse me, perennial alternation in human culture between a despairing relativism and a presumptuous absolutism. Christ is yes and no to culture 
as that reality which in Christ I am, the creator of culture, yet always intractable to it as its presupposition and its enlivening not yet. In Christ I am its ground and goal. I am the source of its life and calling. However, I am such in virtue of being the tensed, oriented, called, mind-body being which I am. I am enlivened and called by a voice which is at once from me and from beyond me. A voice which in its uncanniness isolates me and at the same time forestalls any presumption I might have as an abstracted displaced, objective, untensed mind or ego to lord it, lord it over being. Blanian Meditations provides more than Heideggerian dimensions for unpa unpacking Heidegger's claim that all thinking is called thinking. When I set out to think about thought and its meaning, I cannot but presuppose it. When I set out to think, uh, and when, uh, so I experience it as, as a given. And thinking at bottom is manifest at, as uh, acknowledgement. Thinking at bottom is thanking. So Petit's way of considering the Christ and Christianity anticipates, even in this very early essay, major insights of Polanyi, insights which are greatly enhanced and sharpened by way of the dialogue with Polanyi, culminating in the post-critical logic of Polanyian meditations. Therein we have what certainly bears interpretation as the more recent and thoroughgoing affirmation of at least one side of the two-sided coin which constitutes the thesis of the incarnate word. That is, Polanyian meditation points us to the existential self as the repository of the radicals of all implication, to that passion in which all human life is united, the passion which belongs to the paradoxical unity of our individually tensed, oriented, called mind-body placedness. One of the first uh, phrases Petit used that kind of caught my imagination as a freshman to his classes was uh, uh, the fact that, that each of us has a unique spatio-temporal point of reference in, with, and out of our own bodies. Uh, that kind of grabbed me. But what of the other side of this coin? Is it only in Christ that the ante on this existential passion is, rise to, is raised to the highest pitch? Do possibility and temporality in their most radical sense only enter the world with Christianity, as Kierkegaard claims and as Petit seems to claim in this early essay? In short, how radically do we take the incarnation of the word a specific existential self as the corollary of what W. H. Auden called the redemption of reason from incestuous fixation on its own logic. Perhaps the most suggestive evidence in support of this scandal of particularity lies in the decision, excuse me, in the direction of the consideration that no parrot can answer that question, only an existential self. The scandal of Petit's Christi Christology is like that of Kierkegaard, for both Christianity is what Kierkegaard called a communication of existence. For both the transcendent element in the Word of God communicates precisely by its being correlated and correspondent to the non-symbolic eye, the incarnate word, the acting self before all things and nearer than breathing. 
It communicates the how of actual relation rather than the metaphysical what of a mind in a purely subjunctive mood. So it does seem clear that Petit's Christology was, at a very early time in his thinking, the indispensable wellspring of the most radical post-critical theory of knowledge and of logic. And it seems promising to inquire to some of the other theological implications of this correlation. While considering the texts of Polanyi, Petit, and Kierkegaard, I have repeatedly found myself reminded of that ever provocative statement about faith made in Hebrews 11.1. Uh, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. An import of this in light of the foregoing is that it significantly enriches or changes the dialectic, changes the dialectic between Athens and Jerusalem, faith and reason. Faith in a generic sense may be seen as the correlate of the fiduciary foundations of my commitment situation, which, as Polanyi has said, cannot be non-committally expressed. Faith is the specific, in the specifically Christian sense of our present context is the most positive, conceivable, dialectical relation of thought. Reason redeemed from incestuous fixation upon its own logic the most conceivable dialectical relation of thought to its commitment situation. Uh, parenthetically here, I think it's important to note that Petit has quoted, uh, quoted Auden, and both Petit and Auden are echoing Kierkegaard's treatment of the question of whether there's anything thought can't think. Did you ever think about that? <laughs> Kierkegaard deals with this through the pseudonymous author and comedian, Johann, comedian Johannes Clemachus, in a work entitled Philosophical Fragments. Jerry Gill, the first person I heard him, I heard him use the expression philosophical tidbits, which is pretty appropriate, I guess, um, entitled Philosophical Fragments, and in its sequel, concluding unscientific PS, postscript. Uh, it should be noted that this latter work is entitled or subtitled A Mimic Pathetic Dialectic Composition and Existential Contribution. <laughs> A Mimic Pathetic Dialectic Contribution an existential contribution. Kierkegaard regards the transition from the presumptive, objective, aesthetic modality of being as not to be realized by way of rational, at that time Hegelian dialectic, but rather by way of existential engagement and its correlated pathos, suffering. In Petit, then, as in Kierkegaard, the Cartesian cogito is stood on its head. I think, therefore I am, is subverted. I am, therefore I think. Thought recognizes its own foundations as given and as at bottom acknowledgement. Faith for Augustine, Kierkegaard, Alden, Petit, and Petit's Polanyi is uh, thought having recognized both its captivity to and its liberation by the I am, the coefficient of all predication as that unifying presence which it is and which it relies upon. So faith and the I am are corollary. Faith is the substance of hope by virtue of being the continuing embodiment of hope, the continuing actualizing of possibilities of unification, 
and thereby also being an ever-renewed bearing upon an ever-renewed and renewing future. Further, the very process of enactment is the ultimate and paradigmatic evidence of the not yet. It is the real future proleptically present in the tense called oriented mind-body existence, which is the I am. We may be said to move, move from faith to faith, hope to hope, evidence to evidence through indwelling ever more comprehensive legacies. And in these terms, we understand anew Paul's claim that it will come to pass that Christ is all in all. He is not all thinking concerned with ligator and prolepsis. Does it not ultimately portend and live out of hope of something like a unified field or the communion of saints or the fellowship of the Holy Spirit? Wherein is that unity to be found? But in Christ in you, the hope of glory, the one in whom all things cohere and have their meaning. The hope of the parousia here is not that Jesus will come again, but that the telos does and will make all things bear witness to the Christ, whether hunger, holocaust, or crucifixion. I am the way, the truth, the life. So only that cannot be said, which cannot be embodied, lived, indwelled. However, there would be no life or orientation or presentation were it not for a pathos whose life source is an irreducible and inalienable relation. The I am of call and place and orientation, the person, is the correlative of the God relation and is as such that reality whose non-existence is inconceivable and whose existence is inconceivable because the reality here is being to be contended with the inalienable presupposition of my, all my conceiving and the beginning and ending of all hermeneutical circling. Recall here Polanyi's cryptic and disarming reversal of the Cartesian cog cogito when Petit cites in the face page of Polanyan uh, uh, meditations. I bet you've for, for, forgotten this. Our acceptance of what is logically anterior is based on our prior acceptance of what is logically derivative as being implied in our acceptance of the latter. While I drink water to think about that. <laughs> Our acceptance of what is logically anterior is based on our prior acceptance of what is logically derivative as being implied in our acceptance of the latter. Recall also the same face page and imagine colloquy between Wittgenstein and an inquirer concerning the basis of linguist linguistic meaning. The inquirer says, but couldn't we imagine God suddenly giving apparent understanding and it's now saying things to itself. But here, says Wittgenstein, it's important, an important fact, that I imagined a deity in order to imagine this language didn't emerge from some kind of ratiocination. Did not. Did not emerge from some kind of ratiocination. Perhaps, end of quote, perhaps to many of you all of this is just too pretentious, or at least some of you, too portentously Christian, not to say religious. But Bill Petit, it may be helpful to recall, and Ron has recalled this in an interesting article. That's not supposed to be on, I'm sorry. <laughs> I cut it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> Only rule in this game is you can't cheat. Um, 
Where was it? Uh, the last sentence. <laughs> you were quoting me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. I was, ab I was about to. I hadn't quite got there yet. Uh, <laughs> Right. Yeah, you're you're with it. And here, let, let me pick up. But Bill Petit, Bill Petit, it may be helpful to recall, was not incarnated in a vacuum in an extended family of, but in an extended family of brilliantly talented people, most of whom were highly educated, theologically articulate Christians. And he was born in China to parents who were Christian missionaries. This combination of contexts not to lose sight of the richness of his formal education, surely deeply embedded him in an unusually profound sensibility about personhood and the reality of what Denis de Rougemont called man's Western quest. And de Rougemont's one of the first uh, people he introduced me to in that freshman mm -hmm. state. And... Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to ask you what that means. <laughs> uh, I believe that at times his own incarnation <clears throat> in and of this mythos even took him by surprise. As we have seen, as early as incarnate word, he had clearly identified with St. Paul's claim, for me to live is Christ. Um in the long view of his emerging self-awareness, he did not reject his pre polonian meditations, the writings, but he came to embrace them at a new level, somewhat chastened by a recognition of where he had been self-defeating in his pursuit of giving expression to what Kierkegaard called the truth of subjectivity. It is appropriate and instructive to note that here the dialectic is, as Kierkegaard had it, pathetic, a journey through being wounded from behind. It should be clearly noted that the Christological theological functions, which were clearly present from the beginning, persisted in a potent and developed way right through his last published volume. In recovering the ground in which he, he, he states as is his fundamental premise, quote, my thought is grounded in myself before God that I, a historical being, may stand before God, who appears before me, <clears throat> as I before him, as the keeper of my responsibility and the endorser of my being, and as the radix, <coughs> excuse me, as the radix from which all my existence and reflection issue forth. He claimed Kierkegaard as, quote, the one who authorized for me my own profoundly apprehended sense that I exist before God. And in doing this, he enabled me to discover my sentient, motile, oriented mind-body in the, in the world from which, in authentic acts of speech, I transcended, providing me with the ground upon which at its radix no dualism could find a purchase thereby supplying me with a foundation from which to define and attack the dualisms of the 17th century. Finally, I believe these observations reflect what may, what may be a somewhat astonishing perspective for some who've certainly been strongly energized by other aspects of Petit's thinking. That for Petit, the person is the I am mirrored in the Christ of faith, and the tacit coefficient of what Petit and St. Paul call the regenerate mind, who can say with St. Paul, uh, I quote Petit here, St. Paul in the body of Christ, I am persuaded that neither communism nor fascism, Freudianism nor Jungianism, Einsteinianism nor the theory of ever-expanding universe, neither historicism nor impressionism, existentialism nor logical positivism, the theory, the theory of deficit finance, 
nor the principle of complementarity can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. <laughs> nor a telephone. <laughs> nor a telephone. Thank you. I find a striking echo of this perspective in Charles Taylor's conclusion in his Sources of the Self. He says, there's a large element of hope it is a hope I see implicit in Judeo-Christian theism and in its central promise of a, divine, of a divine affirmation of the human more total than humans can ever attain. Unaided. So be it.